Our scripture for today is from Malachi, uh, and we are in chapter 2. Verses 10 through 16. Have we, not, have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, <clears throat> you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your, offsprings, your offerings or accepts those with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. <clears throat> I have a question for you this morning, and this is a question that I was asked all oh, probably 15 or 20 years ago um, by a seminary student from another country. Is marriage sacred? Is marriage sacred? And of course, I said, yeah. He says, well, then explain something to me. He says, in your country where marriage is sacred, about half the people get divorced. In my country where it's not sacred, it's just a legal thing, only about two or three percent get divorced. How can you explain that? And I didn't have an explanation. But it got me thinking, how seriously do we take marriage and divorce? And I think in our culture, and I know, you know, as, as one, like I've said, I've, I've gone through a divorce myself. Nobody's here to, to judge what anybody's gone through in the past. But I think it's so important in a culture where marriage is sort of becoming less and less and less and less significant, that we look at what God's word says about it and that we honor it uh, as God would have us honor it. it. It represents the union of Christ and the church, and so it's a, it's a big deal. It's important. And so there's a real clear passage here uh, about marriage and divorce, and very relevant, I think, for today. Um, there's, uh, there's actually three ways in this passage where uh, this relationship is, is dishonoring to God. Um, and you know, for the first time in history, in the last few years, did you know that the divorce rate among Christians is higher than the divorce rate among non-Christians? <laughs> you know? And again, I can't explain that. It's just how it is. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, but breaking God's covenant, um, it's going against what God created and God says he's a witness to that. He says that you profane his name, the, the Israelites, by what they were doing. And he says it's detestable. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a category where I'm profaning the name of the Lord or being detestable. So there's three ways. Um, and we often only think of one here. Um, the first thing, how do we 
profane uh, and are unfaithful to God's covenant? Number one would be marriage. <laughs> marriage. Marriage to the wrong person. Marriage to the wrong person. One way to not take marriage very seriously is just get married to, you know, <laughs> way too easily. And I think that happens. You know, you, I was at a wedding last night, and, you know, you think about weddings, and in the last couple of years, I, I learned the word venue. Venue never used to be an issue. Now it's everything's a venue. And sometimes I think people get in love with a wedding instead of in love with the other person and committed to marriage. And so marrying the wrong person, not taking it seriously, and what they were doing here, and there's a lot of background here. They had been in exile, and they knew that they were only supposed to marry people who believed in the Lord. But, you know, they were in other countries, and they fell in lust with some of the women of the other countries, and they got married to these, these women who were worshiping foreign gods in this new temple that's being built. So it was a mess. And you know, sometimes marriages get people into a mess. Sometimes it ends up where nobody intends it to go. And so they were in a mess, and Ezra had come in uh, about this same time. We're not really sure which, which came first. And he basically was real straight up with them, and he said, you know, either go to these other countries or get rid of these wives, send them back. Let's, let's, be, let's start honoring God. But we often forget that, you know, not marrying the right person. And, you know, in the New Testament, it tells us in 2 Corinthians not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, I don't want anybody to raise your hands, but if, have you ever dated an unbeliever? Uh, as a new Christian, I did, you know, dated a girl that she wasn't, she wasn't a Christian. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, with a little bit of my influence, she could become a Christian. She started coming to church with me and stuff for a while, but then... Everything went bad, and, you know, the, the reality of her faith wasn't, wasn't there. I think she was trying to jump through hoops to make it look like she was a Christian more than any, anything else. And so, and I, I talk to people every day who say, you know, I'm married to this person, and they've got an addiction problem, or they've got this problem, and... I usually ask them, well, so were they doing that when you met them? Then people say, yeah. Why did you think it would change? Why did you think it would change, you know? But we have this ideal view that, you know, once they get married to me, everything's going to turn wonderful. Um, I usually tell couples when I do premarital counseling, whatever it is that is a problem now, when you get married, multiply it times 10. Because the motivation goes down and the frustration goes up. And, you know, falling in love is easy, but making a marriage work is hard. I don't care who you are. It's a hard thing. And, um, you know, we have this American thing. And I, I don't know if it's in other countries or not, but I know it's sure here. It's like, I'm in love. How many times have you heard but I'm in love. Like we're supposed to say, oh, okay, nothing else matters. You know, all of the guidelines God gives us, that doesn't matter. All the terrible ways this person treats me doesn't matter because I'm in love. I'm in love, like that's the one thing. And yet, most people can't even explain what that means. And often it's just an emotion that kind of comes and goes. And that feeling of being in love after you spend a little time in a bad relationship, it kind of fades. And so I think God gives us a little bit more guidance than just the emotional thing of, oh, but I love this person. 
Falling in love can be pretty easy. Now, often, I do want to speak to this, in an existing marriage, one person comes to Christ, begins to follow the Lord, and the other person isn't there yet. That's a little different than someone who knowingly marries somebody who doesn't share your faith. I mean, if you think about it, as a Christian, who's your heavenly father? Or who's your father? It's your heavenly father, God, right? For a non-Christian, who's their spiritual father? The devil, right? We're under sin and, you know, under the, the powers of this world. So, like Josh McDowell said years ago, he said, that makes Satan your father-in-law. He said, then you wonder why you have in-law problems. So, it really is important And I I realize that I'm talking to lots of people in lots of different situations. But you know, this value of marriage, I think it's it's big enough and significant enough. It it applies to us no matter what state that we are in. I think honoring marriage, whether we're married or not, or whether we want to get married or not, is still an important sacred thing that God gives us. And we can have influence on others. Um, the second way we can be unfaithful to God's covenant is through divorce. So we can be unfaithful through marriage, but we can also be unfaithful through divorce. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel in chapter 2, verse 16. And if any of you have been through a divorce or been a child with parents who went through a divorce or had any involvement in it, you'll understand why God hates it. You'll understand. Most people have been through divorce, they hate divorce too. It's a brutal thing. It does something to you very, very painful. And so that's why God hates it. He doesn't want us to be hurt. He doesn't want us hurting each other. And it is important to say, even though God hates divorce, God doesn't say he hates divorced people, okay? There have been times, and, you know, I know even after I was divorced, before I was divorced, I probably could have applied to a lot of churches and had a lot of opportunities. After I was divorced, it was a whole different world. Sometimes Christians are the most harsh on judging people who are wounded, And, you know, there's almost this idea that you're a second-class citizen if you're divorced. And I want to make sure that's not what we're promoting here at all. We're just saying we we want to follow God's will. We want to look at a sense of commitment. You know, years ago, the divorce rate wasn't as high because people needed each other. They needed each other, and... They didn't think about, well, I'm not happy. And let me tell you something. If you are looking for somebody else to make you happy, you're set up for a disaster. But a lot of times, that's what we do. We look for someone who will bring us the happiness that we don't have. And you know what? If you can't find happiness without somebody, you're not going to find happiness through somebody. That's too big of a job description. And if somebody tries to make it your job to make them happy, run. (laughs) Because you'll never be able to live up to it. God says he hates divorce. He hates the ripping apart of what has become one. He hates the pain that it causes everyone involved. He hates the broken promises and the broken union. He hates the sense of violence that covers the lives of those who have been affected by it. And those who have been through it understand. And you know the ugliness and the brutality and you see people fighting and it can be, it can be tremendous. 
kids are often stuck in the middle and it's a, it's a, it's a real brutal thing. Now, there used to be, historically, there's always been three things that Christians would say are valid reasons for divorce. Um, the three A's, basically, would be adultery, abuse, and abandonment. Adultery, abuse, and abandonment. And if any of you were raised Catholic, I, uh, I know that people have got, had to go through the Catholic Church before their divorce or after their divorce even and get it annulled and they had to be able to prove one of these things. So, uh, and most of them are, are fairly self-explanatory. Um, you know, cheating, we realize. And another thing I think that's important is if one of th- these things happens, it doesn't say that God demands that you get a divorce, okay? I've seen couples where somebody cheated and you know, they were able to put the marriage back together and it got healthier than it was before. But it's definitely a crossroads where, you know, a couple has to look at. But Jesus, again, even in the New Testament, would would say that if someone has already committed adultery, well, then you're not bound to that person. Um, Second would be abuse. You know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm married, and so I can't divorce no matter what. And they're getting beaten. I've even had people who, they've got stabbed, and they want to get back together as soon as they're allowed to talk to each other again. Um, and sometimes people do that because they're trying to honor God. And you know, folks, I, I don't see where that honors God. I mean, God can overcome anything if it stops. But some people, they're so, I think, on a misunderstanding. God's ha- God hates divorces, all they remember, and so they cling on to that uh, at their own risk. And we'll see later in this passage, God's not encouraging that. And then... Abandonment, where somebody just leaves. And you can only do your part, you know. It takes two people to make a decision to get together and only one person to make a decision to end a relationship. That's the math of it, (laughs) you know. And one person can make that choice and if you're in the other spot, you don't have any real choice. You just have to kind of sit there and take it. And that's why God hates it. It's so painful. Um, The third reason on your handout here, um, and let me say before I go on even, there can be other things that are a serious betrayal, I believe. You know, there's a point where people make a mockery of, of a marriage by going on in it. Um, I think one of those situations would be, you know, drug addiction, drug or alcohol addiction to where, you know, they're, they're spending everything, everything's gone. Um, if you've been around and, uh, as, you know, a serious addict, the hope that tomorrow they're going to wake up and change, you know, there's not a very big percentage chance. And I've seen people who, you know, gambling addictions lost the house a couple times and the kids didn't have food. And, you know, there's some of those things that I think they so violate and betray the other person that to stay together and pretend like everything's good, you know, at what point is that really honoring God, you know? And so... I think we have to look at some of those situations and say, that violates the covenant. That breaks that marital promise to love and honor and protect and keep and be devoted to this person when you go do certain things like that. And that's not an easy decision. 
if, you, you know, if you've ever been in that spot. <clears throat> it's a tough decision. Um, and, and the third is violence. It says God hates divorce, but it also says that God hates violence. And this passage here, it says, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment. Now, it can be translated because it's a, it's a pronoun. I hate a man's covering can be himself or his wife with violence. So it's a little unclear. But anyways, somebody who brings violence into the marriage, that's not okay. And I think that's something as the church we have to say, because I've heard people say, well, my church says I have to stay together no matter what. God doesn't say that. God doesn't say that. And I'm, I've worked a lot with domestic violence. They say it takes nine times on the average for the abused person to leave before they can make it stick. Because part of the abuse ends up making the other person so dependent that they don't know how they're going to survive. God doesn't condone that kind of thing. And so, you know, God hates divorce, yes, but it's not honoring God. And I have a hard time understanding how you can physically injure someone on purpose and say that you love them. That doesn't work in my brain. And I don't know that it works in God's plan either. You know, that... I can't put that together. And so whatever love, again, back to that love feeling means, it doesn't mean enough to honor that person and to control yourself when you're upset. So I don't know what kind of love it is, but it's not God's love. And it's not the kind of marital commitment that God calls us to. God hates violence. There's no place for it in the marriage relationship. And, you know, either the violence needs to end or the relationship needs to end. Now, I have seen people who usually had a connection, about 90% of the people that we saw had a connection with alcohol. It was alcohol and violence all came together. And so the addiction part had to be dealt with too. And, you know, I saw a lot of people actually change their lives. They were living the way they grew up. They were dealing with conflict the way they saw it. But once they actually got into some counseling, got some help, they really did change. But it takes more than, I'm sorry, here's flowers. I'll never do it again. You know, don't buy that one. It's not that simple. They say it takes at least six months of treatment to begin to change the way that people interact with other people like that. And so, it needs to stop. And that doesn't honor God, I don't believe. And I've had people, well, I'm staying for the kids. As long as, they, as long as they just beat me and not the kids, we'll be okay. But what are we teaching our kids? That it's okay to be treated that way. It's okay to be treated that way. And so they're going to go out and find people or be people who follow those relationship patterns. So, God, God's covenant is betrayed when we marry, marry people that we shouldn't. When we divorce people when we shouldn't. <laughs> and when there's violence. And that's what Malachi is talking about here. And the application, you know, if you're in marital trouble... Your job, if you're, the, if you're a Christian, is to, to be the reconciler. Try to make it work. You know? Um, do as much as you can. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says that that's kind of our job, is to be the agent of reconciliation. But also realize you can only do your part. You can only do your part. We can never change another person. You know, we... 
a lot of times we'll think, well, if I do a good enough job as a husband or a wife, they'll change. You know, it doesn't work that way. We can't do their work for them. Um, so if you're in marital trouble, do what you can and then know, know that limit. Nobody else can make that decision for you. If you're divorced, remember that Jesus loves you and you're not a second-rate citizen. <laughs> you know, he loves you incredibly. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Draw near to him and realize that divorce is not the unforgivable sin because some, sometimes people can make it seem like that. Are you unmarried or widowed? You know, keep God first. Pursue relationships the way God wants you to. If you seek to get married, choose wisely. Choose wisely. And I, I wish I was talking to a, a bunch of teenagers or, or 20-somethings um, saying that, but you talk to them. You can tell them. Choose wisely. It's one of the biggest choices we ever make, isn't it? And it makes so much difference. But look for someone who shares your faith. Why would we want to marry somebody who doesn't have the same faith that we do? Sooner or later, it's gonna come head to head. Because as a Christian, our ultimate goal is to serve Jesus and please him with everything we can. And if that other person doesn't see it that way, it's not gonna make sense. And if you are in a relationship where you, you know, you accepted Christ and you have faith and the other person isn't there yet, you know, be faithful and pray for them. The New Testament, Paul says, if they want to leave, let them leave. You can't make them stay, but, you know, you might be that, that light. Live before them and pray for them. And I've seen God turn, turn people around, but it's a, tough, it's a tough decision. It's a tough way to live. Um, and if you're married or remarried, God's plan is that you guard yourself in your spirit and don't break faith. That's what he says right here. Guard yourself in your spirit and don't break faith because you know what? The world isn't going to try to help you with your marriage. Your job isn't going to try to help you with your marriage. Often your kids aren't going to try to help you with your marriage. You're going to have to guard yourself because there's all of these forces that work to tear apart what God has ordained. So keep the covenant and be faithful to the Lord. Romans 8 says, what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember that. Remember God is for us. God is, God's pro-marriage, okay? <laughs> you know, he wants you to be blessed and to do well. And he wants you to honor him through that commitment. And you know, we'll never marry a perfect person. But we can be faithful. And we can honor God through loving that other person, through our actions, through the way that we, we live. And you know, that'll draw them closer to Jesus when they see Jesus in us. And with that, uh, let's, let's close in prayer. And I, I, wanna, I wanna pray for each of us because this is a, a really significant aspect in, in all of our lives. Lord God, we come to you and Lord, you know the state that we are in right now. And Lord, you're not surprised by that, so I ask that you would help us to be faithful to you. Help us to honor you in our relationships and in our, in our marriages. And Lord, for those who are still carrying around wounds, God, I ask that you would, you would be the healer. Lord, you would knit together those broken hearts and you would, you would be strong and you would be the comforter. And God, for those who are married today, God, I ask a special blessing on their marriage. I ask that you would help them by your spirit. Lord, that you would walk them through any, any difficulties or struggles. And Lord, that you would be honored as the center of their lives and of the center of their marriage. Lord, we, we want to honor you in this way. And so we ask for your blessing 
In Jesus' name, amen.